The Dead Have Never Died by Edward C. Randall Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Forward I have had strange experiences in my psychic investigations during the last twenty years. Refusing to be limited by accepted laws, I have devoted my thought to conditions prevailing beyond what is generally termed the material, and by combining and blending the mental and vital with the tangible or physical forces, I have been able to have speech with those long thought dead. As a result, I have found an unknown country about and beyond this earth, and I would not go from this world of men without leaving a record of what I have learned. We are but custodians of knowledge as of wealth, and it is the duty of every one to give to others that which he has acquired whenever it will add to human happiness. There are certain people born with what is known as psychic force, who, when scientifically developed, become instruments by the aid of which communication is established between the two worlds. Such was Emily S. French, she was a woman, over eighty years of age at the time of her death. Above the average in intelligence, she devoted her life to helping others, and as a result, her character was spiritualized and refined so that only good could come within her environment. I was indeed fortunate in my association with her. Even with such help, however, it required many years of work and experiment to obtain the exact conditions whereby satisfactory speech could be had with inhabitants of this unknown country, and from them to secure direct information of the conditions prevailing there. This, in a measure, I have accomplished. That life continues beyond the grave, Lombroso, Richet, Sir William Crookes, T. W. Stanford, William T. Stead, Sir Oliver Lodge, all psychic scientists, and of late Sir Conan Doyle, have proved beyond question. My efforts have been to discover by what law survival becomes possible, to learn something of the death change, the character of individual life as it continues, and the conditions prevailing beyond the earth plane. If the information that I have obtained is reliable, and if my deductions are correct, a discovery has been made that takes from the human heart the awful fear of death. No subject in the world is so important as this, and none is less understood. In this world beyond, there are men and women just as here. Their bodies, etheric in character, are composed of matter, Therefore they have form, feature, and expression, neither less nor more individual than when they lived the earth life. They have homes as tangible to them as our homes are to us, composed of etheric material, just as our homes are made of physical substances. And in those homes, the family relation is ultimately continued. They labor to increase their knowledge, and under the great prevailing law in force there, enrich themselves by helping others. These propositions 
far beyond human experiences, are not only hard to explain, but are difficult to grasp. In the chapters that follow, I have tried to make the facts so plain that all may comprehend them. I have faithfully described some of my experiences and given in substance the data as presented to me. Are my deductions warranted? This research has been a source of great pleasure and profit to me. In the beginning I looked upon the death change with horror. I recall the casket containing the mortal remains of my mother lowered into a grave on a bleak April day. The pitiless rain, the biting winds, the lowering clouds. After the frozen earth had fallen into the open grave, I, a boy, walked alone, and then and there resolved that I should never rest content until I had solved the problem there presented, and come to know, if it was given man to learn, something of that great change. Whether I have succeeded or not, you must judge. I have, I think, demonstrated that nothing in nature is hidden from man. There is no problem that cannot be solved. There is no condition that cannot be understood, provided that we labor long and earnestly for the goal desired. Again, one word to those who mourn. There is no death. There are no dead. Those whom we love and who loved us, in obedience to the great law of evolution, have simply progressed to a new plane of existence. Our eyes no longer behold them, our hands and lips no longer touch them, but their eyes behold and their hands touch us, though we feel them not. They walk with us, they know our trials, help us by their mental suggestions, and comfort us by tender, loving thoughts. Those who live in the etheric or mental plane are no less real to me than those with whom I walk from day to day. I have submitted this manuscript to a large number of advanced thinkers, both in America and in Europe, and the general criticism has been that it is so in advance of experience, so different from the old teachings and beliefs, that few will grasp or understand the new propositions presented. This is without doubt true, but the facts as I have gathered them cannot be changed. Truth is infinite. Volumes have been written by the world's foremost writers to prove the possibility of communication between this plane and the next, though few have been privileged to enjoy direct and independent speech to the extent that I have. Those who read the pages that I have written must assume that speech is possible and that I have had the experiences narrated. I do not attempt to enter the elementary field. Others have covered that branch. I have tried to transmit facts as they've been given to me, and I expect many to accept them because they are in accordance with nature's law and appeal to reason. It is a great privilege to be evolved out of the mass of life, to obtain individuality with all its possibilities, not by a miracle, but through positive law. But that privilege brings responsibilities. 
among them the necessity of living a clean life, of developing character to the utmost, of doing something to make others happy, and of making the world a little better because we have lived a day within its confines. These things are not difficult to accomplish if we are unselfish. To the new thought, to the progress of the world, each may give something. Great truths come from the obscure. The night brings forth the stars. Edward C. Randall Chapter 1. Voices of the Living Dead The suggestion that the dead have never died when so little is known of that great change is beyond the comprehension of the average mind. The fact that under scientific conditions those in the afterlife have had speech with us in the earth life taxes credulity, but such is the fact. Sir William Crookes has had the experience of communicating with the dead and has written concerning it. Stead's Bureau in London, working with Mrs. White, an American psychic, has done so with great freedom. For many years, Daniel Bailey of Buffalo was able, with the aid of Mrs. Swain, to get the direct or independent voice. He did a great work and has published the results. I mention these instances to show that I'm not the first who's been able to obtain direct speech with those in the next life. Thousands in other ways have obtained messages from the great beyond, but only on rare occasions have conditions been such that the dead could speak audibly. The independent voice is unusual, but when heard, it leaves nothing to conjecture. How is it possible, one asks, to talk with dead people. I confess that such a proposition is beyond the comprehension of many, and that a mere statement on the subject means nothing to the average individual, for one can appreciate only those things which he has experienced, or of which he has knowledge. It is only by understanding that the spirit world is a part of this world, that it is here and about us, that it is material, that all life force finds expression only in the physical, and that people beyond the grave still inhabit their etheric bodies, that one can appreciate the fact that speech with the living dead is possible. Even with such an understanding, it is necessary to create certain scientific conditions if one would actually converse with those of the spirit world. The conditions permitting speech are very delicate. The atmosphere at times interferes with results. For example, when the air is agitated before a storm, it is impossible to do this work. But on clear nights, when the air is quiet, the manifestations are beyond power of description. Absolute darkness is necessary to enable me to hear the direct speech of those people who, present in my home in their own spirit bodies, use their own tongues and make their own voice vibrations. To do this work requires the aid of a person possessed of vital forces out of the ordinary. The group of people in the next life working with me 
utilized the vital force of Mrs. Emily S. French in conjunction with their own force and created a new condition in which vibrations were slow. It was then possible for the spirits to so clothe their organs of speech that their words sounded in our atmosphere. If we accept the hypothesis that spirit people have bodies and that they are around and about us in an invisible world, it does not require any stretch of imagination to appreciate the possibility of speaking with those beyond the earth plane. When we appreciate the fundamental fact that the universe is matter and that life itself is matter, new possibilities open to us. I asked one who spoke to us, Tell us of the condition that enabled you to speak. The spirit replied, There are in our group seven people, all expert in the handling of the electric and magnetic forces. And when you and the psychic, Mrs. French, meet, the vital force that emanates from her personality is gathered up. We also take physical emanations, or substances, from you and the others with you. And while we contribute to the mass a certain spirit force, now that force which we gather and distribute is just as material as any substance that you would gather for any purpose. It is simply higher in vibration. We clothe the organs of respiration of the spirit who is to speak, so that his voice will sound in your atmosphere. And when this condition is brought about, it is just as natural for a spirit as it is for you. You then have what is known as the direct or independent voice, that is, the voice of a spirit speaking as in earth life. Since mankind came up out of savagery, the great problem has been, and ever will be, what is the ultimate end? What, if anything, waits on the other side of death's mysterious door? What happens when the hour strikes that closes man's earth career? when, leaving all the gathered wealth of lands and goods, he goes out into the dark alone. Is death the end, annihilation and repose, or does he awake in some other sphere or condition, retaining individuality and identity? Each must solve this great question for himself. Dissolution and change have come to every form of life and will come to all that live. With opportunity knocking at the door, mankind has but little more appreciation of it now than it had when phallic worship swayed the destinies of empires. It may be that, as people, our development has been such that we could, heretofore, grasp and comprehend only length, breadth, and thickness, the three accepted dimensions of matter. That in our progression we have but now become a bit able to appreciate and understand life forces that find their expression beyond the physical plane. Time was when all knowledge was handed down from one generation to another by story, song, and tradition. When the Persian civilization was growing old and ambition towered above the lofty walls of Babylon, 
when Egypt was building her temples on the banks of the Nile, when Greece was the center of art and culture, and Rome, with its wealth and luxuries, held sway over the civilized world, people did not dream of type and the printing press, or applied electricity, or navigation of the air, and the many inventions that were to come, they were not ready for such progression. The world cannot stand still. The great law of the universe is progress. Two or three generations since, the idea that a cable would one day be laid under the sea, and that messages would be transmitted under the waters and over the waters from continent to continent, was laughed at as a chimera. Only a little while ago the world could not understand how words and sentences could be flashed across the trackless ocean from ship to ship and from land to land without wires in space. And who shall now say that it's not possible to send thoughts or words, sentences, voices even, and the messages out into the ether of the spirit world, there to be heard, recorded, and answered. Has man reached the end of his possibilities? Will all progression stop with Marconi's achievements and telephoning without wires? This is the age of man. We have passed the age of gods. If our development is such that we can comprehend the life and conditions following dissolution, it must be within our grasp as surely as progress has been possible at all times and among all people since the world began. Our age is one of sudden and rapid changes. What was true yesterday assumes a different one could almost say a diametrically op opposite aspect today. Our people are in a state of transition. New views come with changing times and conditions. Most minds are sensitive, alert, and versatile, and the present is fraught with unrest and a thirst for knowledge. This is a period that will be fruitful in scientific discoveries and in the adaptation of the universal law of vibratory action. We need not be afraid of investigation. All truth is safe. Nothing else will suffice. And he who holds back the truth through expediency or fear fails in his duty to mankind. Some have come to know what awaits over the great divide, have solved the great problem of dissolution, and with the confidence born of knowledge, based on facts proved and demonstrated, are ready to speak with authority. As one among the many, I again give the world the result of my continued research in the new field of psychic science. We have looked upon the discarded physical body, habitation or housing, occupied by one while developing on the earth plane, and have said, He is dead. Never again will his voice speak words of tenderness. His hands touch or eyes look upon us. Never more will we know his tender loving care. He is no more. Such is the erroneous conclusion ever reached by the human mind. When at night we lay aside our clothing, we are the same. When at the end of a short span we separate from the fleshly garment we've worn, we are not dead. We are identically the same person, mentally, morally, and spiritually as before with the same etheric body, with power to think and function as in earth life. 
I say with all the strength and force at my command that there is continuity of all life, that nothing is ever lost, that communication is possible and has been had with those in the afterlife in many ways. My effort has been to create a condition in which it became possible for spirit people to clothe with physical substance their organs of respiration so they could talk to us as when in earth life. It has been my privilege to hear their voices, best of all methods, hundreds of times. Thousands of individuals have spoken using their own vocal organs, and I have answered. From this source has come great knowledge, facts beyond the learning of men, not found in any books, and it is my privilege to give them to you. Lay aside your preconceived notions. Discard prejudice, be fair and unafraid, while in simple language I relate what has come to me from this wonderful source. If you are not impressed with its truth, discard it. If it appeals to reason, it will be a help not only here, but hereafter. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 A Conscious Dissolution Yes, I know that I am no longer an inhabitant of the Earth's sphere, that I am numbered among the dead. So, because I thoroughly understand the great change through which I have passed, the group of spirit people working with you and controlling conditions on this side have asked me to speak to you and through you to all those who sorrow for their dead. You know, of course, that in speaking I am now using my own voice. Out of the silence, out of the darkness, in a room devoted solely to psychic investigation came those words. One whom the world calls dead was speaking. I have never ceased to be startled when a voice first speaks from the invisible world. So unusual, so marvelous, so wonderful, and yet, to me, so natural. I know of but two psychics who are able to contribute to conditions that make the direct or independent voice possible. Emily S. French, who devoted to my work the best years of her life, was one of them. And on this occasion, she was alone with me in the room in my own home, devoted solely to such work. At this time the conditions were such that it was possible for those out of the earth body to so talk that their voices were audible. The public wants to know, and I had always wanted to know, the sensation involved in the death change, in the awakening, what it is that the eyes behold or the ears hear when first consciousness continues or returns. So, when this man spoke so clearly and strongly, I determined to get, for one who had made the change, a comprehensive statement of the mental state, not only before, but after the transition. I said, so much of the information that we get from the plane where you now live is general in character. Won't you be specially specific and tell us, first, something of your occupation, 
and of the conditions immediately preceding your dissolution. He replied, I came from a long line of soldiers. My ancestors fought in the American Revolution and were among those who aided in establishing your republic. Possibly I inherited a martial spirit. When the first shot was fired by the Confederates and Lincoln issued his call for volunteers, I was possessed with the desire to enter the army. I had a wife and two children, to whom, as I now know, I owed a far greater duty than to my country. But the speech of people, the danger of the nation, the condition of slavery prevailing in the southern states, and the preparation for war incited me. With forced words of good cheer, I left the brave wife and little children, enlisted, and became a soldier of the Union. I will not take the time to tell you of my life in the army, except to speak of the nights in the camp when my thoughts went out to those at home. Knowing, as I did, that funds were slowly diminishing, Ever the idea was dominant, that the war would soon be over. Then there would be that homecoming, and the plans I formed to make compensation for my long absence would come to fruition. But the war did not end as battle after battle was fought, with success first on one side and then on the other. I participated in many, seeming to bear a charmed life, for while thousands about me fell, I passed unharmed, and so I grew fearless. I asked, Under what circumstances did you meet your end? It was at Gettysburg, he replied. I can see and feel it all again as my mind concentrates on that tragic event. It was the second day of that great fight. I was then a colonel, and I commanded a regiment in reserve. In front of us the battle roared. Shot and shell filled the air and fell near us. Muskets belched forth their fire. The earth seemed to tremble. Wounded in great numbers were carried to the rear, and we knew that countless dead lay where they had fallen. We waited, knowing it was only a matter of hours, possibly minutes, before the order would come to advance. I looked down the line at blanched faces. We all knew that many of us would not answer the roll call that night. Still, we waited. Suddenly, out of the smoke, galloped an officer from the general's staff. Forward, came the command. There was no faltering now that the hour had come. The column moved. Soon shot and shell fell among us, but on we went. All was excitement. Fear was gone. We had but one desire, and that to kill such is the lust of battle. I recall but little more. We reached the front and saw the gray line charging up the hill towards us, and then oblivion. I now know that I was shot. I said, Tell me of returning consciousness and what you saw. The spirit answered, You must remember that these tragic events occurred nearly half a century ago, and that at that time it had not been discovered that there is another life, a plane as material as the one you now inhabit, where life continues. I had no conception of a hereafter, for with all my religious teachings I had no idea of what or where the future life might be. Nor was I at all sure that there was one, so you can imagine how startled I was to awake, as from a deep sleep, bewildered. 
I got to my feet, and, looking down, saw my body among many others upon the ground. This was startling. I made a great effort to collect my thoughts and recall events. Then I remembered the awful battle. Still, I did not then realize that I had been shot. I was apart from, still I seemed in some way, held to the body I had so lately worn. My mental condition was one of terrible unrest. How was it? I was alive, had a body, and yet, separate and apart from the covering I had thought, constituted the body. I tried to think and realize my situation. I looked about. Others of the seeming dead moved, seemed to stir. Then many of them stood up and, like me, seemed to emerge from their physical bodies, for their old forms still lay upon the field. I looked at other prostrate bodies, examined many, from each something was gone. Going among them again, I found other bodies inhabited, still living, as you would say, though wounded and unconscious. Soon I found myself among thousands in a similar mental state. Not one among them knew just what had happened, and I did not know then as I do now that I always possessed a spirit body composed of a material called ether, and that the physical body was only the garment it wore while in earth life. I asked, what brought you to the full realization of what had happened? I am coming to that, he said. While the passing out of the old body was without pain. It is a terrible thing to drive a strong spirit from a healthy body, tear it from its coverings. It is unnatural, and the sensation following readjustment is awful. In a short time I became easier, but I was still bewildered. It was neither night nor day. About us all was gloom, not a ray of light, not a star. Something like an atmosphere, dark and red, enveloped all of us, and we waited in fear and silence. We seemed to feel one another's thoughts, or, to be more correct, hear one another think. No words were spoken. How long we have remained in this state, I cannot now tell, for we do not measure time as you do. Soon there was a ray of light that grew brighter each moment, and then a great concourse of men and women with kindly faces came and, with comforting words, told us not to fear that we had made the great change, that death so-called, only advanced our sphere of life, that we were still living beings, inhabitants now of the first plane beyond the earth, that we would live on forever, and by labor reach a higher mental development, that for us the war was over, we had passed through the valley of death. I will not attempt to tell you of the sorrow that came with such realization, not for myself, for I soon learned that only through death could we progress, and that the personal advantages beyond the physical were greater than those in the physical. It was sorrow for the wife and the babies, their great grief when they learned what had happened, bound me to their condition, and we sorrowed together. I could not progress or find happiness until time had healed their sorrow. If 
only those in earth life knew that their sadness binds and holds us it stays our progress and development after coming with the aid of many friends to full consciousness and being able to move at will i followed at first the movements of both armies i saw the root of lee's army the final surrender at appomattox and i want to tell you of the great effort the inhabitants of this land in which i live put forth not only to prevent war but to bring peace when nations or people are at war for war has never been right no taking of human life is ever justifiable this is the first time it has been my personal privilege to get a message through to the world I once inhabited. It has been a great pleasure to tell you something of the sensations during and after the change. There is one experience that I want to relate, for it made a profound impression. One day, I saw many people passing into a building having the appearance of a great temple of music. I was told I could go in if I desired. I did. There were assembled, I should judge, about 5,000 people. They sat with bowed heads in a silence so absolute that I marveled, turning I asked one beside me the object of the meeting, and I was told they were concentrating their thoughts, sending out peace vibrations to nations at war. I did not comprehend, but, curious, I waited. Soon, above that great company, arose a golden cloud that formed and moved as if directed. Having learned that I could go at will, I followed and found the cloudy substance enveloping another battlefield. Again, a dark condition with flashes of red immediately surrounding and above two great armies, for the thoughts of those in battle give out emanations producing such effect. It had substantially the same appearance that prevailed on my awakening. As I watched, the dark condition seemed to change, to dissolve before the peaceful conditions of the light that I had followed, just as mist dissolves before the sun. With the change, a better thought filled the minds of those engaged an inclination to treat more humanly the wounded and the prisoners. This is one of the ways those experienced among us help the mental, as those among you aid the physical. Both are equally real. Among us are the great who counsel together and work to influence those in authority against war, while others among us, by thought suggestions, help and sustain those poor soldiers forced into battle, either to satisfy the greed, selfishness, and ambition of those in authority, or to defend a nation or the integrity of their country. We know neither the one side nor the other. We see only the suffering of humanity, a mother's mourning, a wife's heart breaking, a child sobbing. They are all human, and without distinction or class, we labor to comfort and help them by mental suggestion. In such work, we enter their homes, a great invisible host, and many a heart has been cheered through our ministrations. Other wars will come, 
unless the thought of those now in authority changes, then a great work will be required of us for which we are ready. This has been exceedingly interesting, but just one more word. How does your earth life appear after so many years? I asked. How much do you remember of those first years when, as an infant, you gazed upon your world? The man replied. So it is with me. I have but an indistinct recollection of the events that made up my earth life. Only a memory remains. Still, enough to make me regret many lost opportunities. I was not then a thinker, only a drifter. I accepted what was told to me without question. The result was that I did not develop my mental faculties. This life offers such splendid advantages. My joy of living in the present is so intense that I seldom think of earth life at all. All the trials, the sorrows and sufferings incident to birth and the few years in your physical world were necessary, and from my present vantage point, the matter of living a few years more or less, the manner of my going, were unimportant. It is all forgotten now in the wonderful reality about me. As soon as I came to understand what death was, and to what it led, I immediately commenced to complete my education and build a home for the wife and the children, and I'm happy to tell you that again we dwell together, for they are all here in this land of happiness and opportunity. In the presence of such an experience, listening to an individual speaking from the world beyond, telling of another and unknown land, where all the so-called dead live, think, move, develop, and progress, the learned should understand and comprehend that three dimensions and five senses do not explain the conditions beyond. End of chapter 2